Okay. <laughs> we have made our way through the upper respiratory tract, two different cavities that converge to bring air into the lower respiratory tract. <laughs> I am. All right. Uh, so air enters from the pharynx into the lower respiratory tract at the larynx. Okay, so the picture that I just had up there, we're, we're basically right here is where we would line up in this picture here. So the lower respiratory tract just simply consists of additional tubes that eventually are going to terminate very deep within the lungs. And it's at these terminations where we'll have our uh, interaction with the blood supply. Uh, the larynx forms this division. And furthermore, it's a division between air into the lungs and food into the esophagus and the digestive system. So to the lungs will be the trachea, and then to the stomach will be our esophagus. I think St. Patrick's Day was yesterday, but we're going to believe it, Larry. <laughs> <coughs> Just a scotch or a pitch. <laughs> okay, so consists of tubes, and then the larynx is that division, trachea, esophagus. We're worried about the trachea with the respiratory system. This leads into the lungs. Now, from the trachea, so here's our larynx covered up with. Uh, that cartilaginous patch, and then leading into the trachea, and eventually we begin to divert, divert into each of the lungs, left and right lungs, and so we end up with these branch, uh, these branches that begin to begin to form. Uh, the branches from the trachea we lead into the bronchus, and this is going to occur. In division, so left and right. So you'd have the left bronchus and you'd have the right bronchus. And these are divisions of the trachea. Now, from the bronchus, which you can see those divisions there, we have additional branching. And these are little bronchus or bronchioles. Okay, so just simply put, the bronchioles are going to be the tree-like branches of each bronchus. So trachea, so the left and right bronchus, or bronchi, and then the bronchi break up and divide into the bronchioles. Now, eventually, these bronchioles are going to terminate, and they actually become smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can see here's some more divisions, and eventually, we're going to get down to this little level, tiny, little tiny level here called the alveolus or the alveoli. Um, if you go and look through all of the um, the bronchioles, you'll find that we have some that are conducting different levels of those bronchioles as they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the smallest of the bronchioles are going to be blind-ended and they'll terminate at a structure called the alveoli, or alveolus. And 
at the very end, it's not well illustrated here, but we'll see it a little bit later. At the end of those terminal bronchial, the alveoli cluster together and they look like, I've heard them described as a cluster of grapes. However, they're not really the size of grapes. You know what we would think of as being, oh, that's a green grape. Um, they actually look a lot like the size of the very tip of a broccoli plant, a little tiny little nodule on the end of a broccoli. However you describe them, they're terminal ends of the bronchioles. And they are basically just a layer of, one layer of cells, one layer of epithelial cells, and form a small sac-like structure. Terminations at the end of the bronchioles. Okay, so ultimately, upper respiratory, lower respiratory tract is to get the to get the air from external environment into these small little tiny sacs called the alveoli. So we have to constantly be loading the alveoli with air. Now, just like with the upper respiratory tract, there are some purposes for each of these organs along the way. And most of it is related to modifying the air so that it's the right makeup by the time it gets into the alveoli. Okay, so we're going to start out with the larynx. So here we have a cross section through side of the head and side of the neck, and then also a blow up. It would be the laryngoscopic view. Um, using a laryngoscope to look at uh, basically the opening down the throat. The larynx is the house of the voice box. It also helps to maintain an open airway. And along with the pharynx is going to help to control the food and the air go into the right direction. So make sure the tube goes into the esophagus and the air goes into the trachea. Now, the way that this happens is we actually have a control flap called the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is this cartilaginous flap. And it can set over the opening into the trachea. Okay, so we have this cartilage flap. And that's what you can see here. This is that cartilage flap. And here's the opening into the trachea. And it's going to be this epiglottis, this cartilaginous flap that controls controls the opening. And really, it's controlling both of the openings because it's um, going to cover up that opening into the trachea when you swallow, which allows food to go into the esophagus, and then when you breathe, it's open, allowing air to enter into the bronchus. The larynx, uh, and this is similar or related to the, the, the presence of the voice box, uh, it allows us to generate sound. In humans, this allows us to have our, our voice and the ability to speak. In lower order uh, organisms, um, this is still ability to vocalize, squeaking, roaring, things like that. Now, the way that we generate the sound, the hole that leads into the trachea is known as the glottis. 
So that makes a lot of sense that we named the cartilaginous flap over the glottis, or epiglottis, because it's over the glottis. Now this opening into the trachea, which is what you're looking at here, here's into the trachea, this would be, this is the glottis here, the base of the tongue, and then we have our opening or our glottis. Okay, esophagus would be down here, trachea here. Over the glottis, we're going to have our vocal cords. Okay, so the glottis is covered by those vocal cords. And now when we pass air in and out of the trachea, and we can control that pretty precisely, that air that passes, is going to vibrate those cords. And this is very similar to plucking a guitar string or hitting a key on a piano that reverberates a, a, a chord or string on the, on the piano. So we use the air and basically force air through the vocal cords and we cause those vocal cords to vibrate. And as those vocal cords vibrate, we disrupt the air. So the cords are going to resonate what we would refer to as a sound wave. And really, sound wave is just simply a change in pressure. So as I'm talking, the air that's right here in the room, I'm changing the pressure. I'm making these little deflections in pressure. That's what travels to all of your ears, and then you have a neurological circuit that interprets the change in pressure and you actually create what I'm saying in your mind. So we generate those pressure waves or those sound waves. And we can change the characteristics of those sound waves by changing the length of the cord. So we can change by change we can change the length of the cord which leads to different pitches. <coughs> Just like on a guitar, you can put a cable on there and it will shorten the length of the guitar strings that you play with, and that changes the pitch that each of those guitar strings will actually produce or make. Now, I'd really love to chase a rabbit trail right now because the idea of pressure waves and even sight and things like that and what happens neurologically is really, really interesting. But we really don't have time, but there's a lot of really good stuff out on YouTube. Um, ASAP Science, that's a channel on YouTube. They do uh, a lot of different things, and they've talked about um, the perception of, of the mind from changes in pressure waves and um, seeing lights and things like that, and how that's interpreted by the brain. Um, let's just suffice it to say that Sometimes I will say something, and you don't hear me exactly the, exactly the way that it was said, and it's not because I didn't say it good enough. It's because your brains didn't interpret it correctly. We call that a miscommunication. I mean, it could be because I just didn't speak well. Mm -hmm. I like the black and blue dress. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> is exactly <laughs> like the black and blue dress, which is not black and blue. It's white black and brown. White and blue. Yeah, they're really bright. They can't wear purple and all right, all right, before it gets out of here. It is a white and brown or white and gold dress. About the length of your, is it changing the length? Okay, so the vocal cords, what changes the length of them? There's small little muscles in there, smooth muscle that's attached to each of those cords, and it pulls on, on the pulls on the vocal cord to lengthen it out oh. or relax it to shorten it out. The vocal cord also, the, the width changes as well for 
women. They're real thin. For guys who have undergone puberty, they are thicker. And so it's just like the guitar strings. The smallest guitar strings are the highest pitch. The thicker guitar strings are, the, are lower pitch. Uh, so the trachea, leading from the larynx, we end up in the tube called the trachea. Uh, the trachea also is referred to as the windpipe. And anatomically, what you what you can see here is it's stacks of cartilaginous rings. Okay, so stacks of cartilaginous rings. So that's what you're seeing here. This is our um, cartilage. Each of these is a cartilaginous ring. And then we have an intervening ligament, so ligamentous tissue. Now, really, it's not a complete ring, but rather it's an incomplete or C-shaped ring. So the ends that form, and that's what you can see here in this figure. Here's my cartilage, and it's open. And so the ends of the cartilage on this side and on this side, we have what are known as trachealis muscles, or I'm just going to simply call it a smooth muscle uh, linkage. So the ends are attached. A smooth muscle. Is that L shaped or C shaped? C shaped. Now, that smooth muscle that attaches the ends, the trachealis muscles, they can flex. And when they are flexed, we have a decrease in diameter. So the tube will actually get smaller. So if this is my initial cross section, when we have that smooth muscle contraction, it might only be this big. So as we decrease that diameter, what happens is we have a concomitant increase in resistance to airflow. And then the converse will be true. We can have those muscles relax, and when they're in their relaxed state, that results in an increase in diameter and that concomitant decrease in resistance. So increase in diameter, decrease in resistance. Now, what is pretty obtuse here, it's not very clear, but you can, if you get up close, you'd be able to see it. There's, there's actually some cells that line the whole lumen of the trachea. And those are going to be epithelial cells. So lined with epithelial cells. Now, these epithelial cells become pretty important because they are going to help in the process of cleaning the air and, and, and preventing large particulates and, and pollution and debris from getting all the way down into the lungs into the LOV line. So these epithelial cells, uh, some of them are going to excrete mucus. We're going to have mucus excreting cells. Mucus is a sticky substance that we use to trap foreign material. And that foreign material is going to be swept out of the trachea because this, the uh, epithelial cells are ciliated, so they contain cilia which are going to be those arm-like projections 
of membrane that are going to provide sweeping of that mucus. Sweeps the mucus away from the lungs. So away from the lungs towards the external environment. Then you either cough it out or blow it out your nose or swallow it down into your digestive system. And you just break it up in digestion. Filtering like the air and that is better for us to swallow that air, that particles, than to breathe it in. Yeah. Oh, it's way better. Yeah, if, if you get the digestive system, it has an opening on the other end. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the lungs don't exactly have it. Right. So it would get trapped in the lungs, whereas we can get rid of it. I mean, we just would digest it, we would subject it to proteases and acids and, and just break it down. I guess my question was, so if it does get into the lungs, or does it, or does it? Do oh, it? yes. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, I, no. I really misunderstood your question. <laughs> yes, if it gets into the lungs, it builds up in there. These cilia, one of the consequences of smoking cigarettes is you reduce the function of those cilia. And smokers have reduced lung volume because they're beginning to collect the foreign debris and the mucus in their lungs. Mm, delicious. Makes me want to go out and smoke a six pack. No, I. Bone builder. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the bronchi. See, you guys had no reluctance at all. There was like immediate laughter, but the other class was like. Oh, I mean, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is anyone else laughing at it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the bronchii carry the air deeper into the lungs. Okay, so larynx controls to get air into the trachea. The trachea has the ciliae to help regulate how clean the air is, or clean the air also changes its shape, its diameter, to regulate air flow into the lungs. The bronchii are going to carry air deeper into the lungs. Now here, some additional purposes are going to include humidifying the air. We've already seen that some of the air is humidified through the nasal cavity, so we're going to humidify and we're going to warm the air in the bronchii, our left and right, our left bronchus, right bronchus. We're also going to find that the bronchus and, and the bronchii are going to have cells that contain cilia as well. In addition to those ciliated cells, we're going to have occasional mucus producing cells. Okay, so occasional mucus producing cells. Why do I clarify as occasional? It's because the concentration or the density of these mucus producing cells is slowly decreasing as we go deeper and deeper into the lungs. We want to get the air really clean by the time it gets into the bronchi, and now we're just sort of doing a last polishing of the air before it enters into the into the LV line. This is a cross-sectional picture here of those ciliated cells. You can see that very clear here. It looks like a, a brush border or something along those lines. Uh, again, this is going to be to trap even smaller particles that 
get through the nose hairs and then the, uh, the cilia and mucus uh, producing cells of the trachea. So we just are kind of getting that last little opportunity to clean up the air just a little bit further. From here, we'll begin to branch into even smaller and smaller tubes. until we get to our termination point, which will be the alveoli. Everybody good? Okay, so in our alveoli, here's that picture I was talking about. It makes it look like a cluster of grapes. Again, this is very microscopic in size. It's not actually that big. The alveoli are defined as the functional units of gas exchange. The functional units of gas exchange. And what you can see is the spherical shape, so the bunch of grapes shape, facilitates a very high surface area for contact with the blood capillaries. So each of those grapes or nodules going to be surrounded by capillaries. And it is a very dense network of capillaries. Okay? Um, and the spherical shape, having that spherical shape, means that the contact with blood capillaries in all different directions around that spherical shape is at almost its highest. And this is a very optimal way to build this system so we have the high contact between that clean air and the bloodstream through the alveoli and the alveoli capillaries. So the alveoli are constantly going to be filled with air from the environment. And so what that means is since you breathe in, and that air goes all the way down into those, these alveoli, alveoli, we end up with that air from the environment in very, very close contact with our bloodstream. And so this is why it's really important that we clean up the air before it gets to this point. Because we have just one layer of epithelial cells that make up the wall of the alveoli. And it is a very high surface area con point of contact. So not only is it interfaced with a large number of capillaries, but those capillaries are very, very close. So gas exchange is going to be facilitated by the large surface area and the extremely close, close contact between the air and the bloodstream. Now, in all reality, the distances that we're talking about is basically the width of two different cells. However, that really small distance, that tiny fraction of distance, is actually not extremely conducive for gas exchange. In other words, even though it's a very tiny difference, we have to do additional things to make gas exchange really, really effective. 
So the inner uh, inner wall of the L alveoli is actually going to be covered up with a solution called surfactant. And surfactant is basically a fluid that coats the interior of the alveoli and accomplishes two things. The first thing is that by having surfactant present, it allows the alveoli to remain structurally sound. So it allows the alveoli itself to remain structurally sound. So once you pop the alveoli open right after birth, hopefully the rest of your life they remain open. You don't want to have your lung collapse, which would be the structure of the alveoli basically losing its hollow interior. Surfactant is going to partially help that to happen. The other thing, and this is more specific to gas exchange, is the surfactant reduces surface tension. Okay, so we're going to reduce surface tension. And surface tension and reducing surface, ten surface tension here is actually going to be pretty important because, well, first of all, let's, let's make sure we're all on the same page with surface tension. So you've all seen this before. If this is, say, a lake, we have the top of the water that creates a surface. And you can do a lot of really neat things with that surface. If you're a bug called a water strider, you can actually sit on top of it. If you're a basilisk lizard, which is also called the Jesus lizard, you can run across the top of the water. If you are really into skipping stones, you go and find that perfect flat stone and you skip it about 3,000 times, right? That's all because of the surface tension. And these things can happen, skipping stones and you know, a lizard walking across the water, because the tension that's created at that surface is enough that it actually can support and produces an upward force. Now, let's take this idea and let's put it now into the lungs. You have extracellular fluid and you have cellular tissue, you have, you have cells. And eventually you have to get into the bloodstream as well. Each of these has a surface tension. Now I have things like oxygen that I need to get through from the air into the blood. And I have to go through those surfaces. If I have enough surface tension, the oxygen is just going to basically bounce off of or sit on the surface of that surface or sit on the uh, on the surface of that tension so by adding surfactant wherever i put that up here surfactant actually is going to change the surface tension and now oxygen can permeate easily through that surface by the way surfactant um some examples of surfactants that you actually are somewhat familiar with um dish soaps are a type of surfactant uh, in the lab, we use things called Triton X100, which is nothing more than really pure dish soap. And we use it because it helps us to break up the surface tension when we're doing any type of technique. So if you take water or, let's say, oil, which would be another care, uh, uh, um, solution with surfactant properties, and you put it over the surface of the water, the water loses its surface tension and buildings. And so you go and skip water or try to skip a rock across a layer of oil on, let's say, the ocean or something, and it's not going to skip very well. You might be able to give it to skip some, but because the surface can be broken so easily, that rock is, is the weight of the rock is going to actually push through the, the surface of the water. So if we can reduce that surface tension, we can make it easier for oxygen to break through that surface to enter into the bloodstream. OK, 
can't see. We have the surfactant and we have the very small distance that exists between the blood and the air. Surfactant and that small dis distance make it conducive for oxygen and CO2 to cross between the two compartments, the blood and the air. The small distance is just two cells. You have a blood capillary wall cell. And you have the epithelial cell. Of the alveoli. So by the time we get down here, where we're going to begin to exchange oxygen and CO2 with the air, we want that air sample to be ultra pure, and we want it to be the right temperature and the right humidity. So everything leading up to this point, all the stuff that we just discussed, helps to make that happen. Now we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what's actually going on in the LOB line, and we'll look at gas exchange at the uh, cellular and, and, and the molecular levels. But before we do that, let's take a step back and let's just look at the lungs themselves, just the organ that we call the lungs. So here is the lungs in situ. You can see how they are uh, situated within the body. Some anatomical descriptors here. Uh, we would say that the lungs are just deep to the rib cage. So they are just below the surface of the ribs, just deep to the rib cage. And this is for protective purposes. So by having them encased in the rib cage, they are protected. Now, the lungs themselves are each going to be suspended into a membrane. So the lungs are housed in this thing called the pleural membrane or pleural membranes, one membrane per lung. This is a picture that illustrates the pleural membrane. What you're going to see is the membrane is actually going to have a couple different layers. Now, the reason that we use pleural membranes or have pleural membranes is because this prevents the, lug, the lungs from rubbing on the ribs. So we, we can prevent that softer tissue of the, of the lungs from rubbing against the harder tissue of the bone and the muscle. And so we are able to mitigate any frictional concerns. Now, I said that there's a couple different layers. Starting from the outside, the outer layer, the outer pleural membrane is going to line the thoracic cavity. And that thoracic cavity, um, cavity is going to be made up primarily of the lungs. So we're going to have a outer layer that lines the muscles of the ribs and the and the um, and the bones of the ribs themselves. This is called the parietal pleura. And that's what you can see here. This with this outer layer on the outside of the lungs in contact with the rib cage will be our parietal pleura. Then we're going to have an inner membrane that envelops the lung. This is going to be referred to as the visceral pleura. Okay, and that's what you can see here. It's in contact with the lung tissue itself. It's this inner layer. Now, if we have an inner and an outer layer, we end up with a space in between. Now 
that space between the pleura is going to be referred to as the pleural cavity. Now, you've gone all gone shopping before, and I'm sure that you've double bagged for plastic bags. And in a lot of ways, this uh, system of pleural membranes kind of resembles or, or can be modeled by those plastic bags. I mean, think about it. You put two plastic bags together, and the inner bag adheres to the outer bag. There's still space between them, or there's a potential space between them, but you have an inner bag and an outer bag, inner membrane, outer membrane. The same thing happens here where the pleural cavity, this is really, really over-exaggerated. It actually is going to be the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura are going to be in a lot closer contact. They're basically going to sort of adhere together like those plastic bags. Within that potential space or potential cavity, we're going to have this thing called pleural fluid. And pleural fluid is going to aid in creating a near friction free surface or environment for the lungs to move in and out as breathing occurs. So those two um, pleura, one protecting the lungs from the ribs and the other attached to the lungs themselves, can move against each other and not cause a high amount of friction and heat. So this, in a lot of ways, you can think, oh, it's a lot like uh, a motor oil or something along those lines. So again, we're going to call that cavity a potential space. Just because it isn't under physiological circumstances a formed space, but it has the potential to create a space. So normally there's no space between the visceral and the parietal pleura. So those two membranes make contact with each other. And really the only thing that's in there is a layer of fluid. This would be our only barrier. So this would kind of be like in those two Walmart bags, or those two shopping bags, if you were to dump some, I don't know, cooking oil or something like that in between them and let it spread out, you would have the outer bag, the inner bag, and then the fluid inside, and they would still kind of rub together. But it would be in a very low friction environment because of the, 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 uh, the oil that's present. Now, what happens if that potential space becomes a space? Let's say we fill it up with air. So maybe you get into a car accident and you puncture the lung, and the lung, as you breathe, begins to push air out into the uh, pleural cavity. That would be referred to as a pneumothorax. And as the more air gets pumped into that potential space and it becomes a space, eventually your breathing becomes very painful. Now why does the why why would your breathing become increasingly painful? Okay, we also now have a uh, of friction inducing uh, material in, in, in air inside of the inside of that cavity. So very painful breathing is due to that friction. Now every time you breathe, we got that rubbing that's going on. 12 to 20 times a minute if you're at rest. I would think that if you're in a stressful situation, it's probably going to be a little bit quicker than that to add even more uh, consequences to this friction. So you can just sit here now for the next four minutes until the end of class, just rubbing your hands together and see what that feels like. And now imagine that that just walks. 
Yes, Jason. I'm sure you probably can. And it's probably, it's still going to, I mean, you're going to have um, extracellular fluid and things like that that will begin to leak in and it's going to cause the same type of, the same type of problem. That's a really great question. It's a, a pretty interesting question too. So um, treatment, emergency treatment for a pneumothorax. You take a large gauge needle on a open bore syringe and you jam it in there as hard as you can to get into there. And it, it sounds like someone's letting air out of the tire. It's like, and as soon as it releases, even though it's still open, breathing becomes far less painful. No, once you've done it once, you have a, I mean, basically they, they create the opening for you and then, I don't know what, I don't, I don't have any idea what the next step would be after that if they suture it back together or, yeah, they just, they just cut it out and they're like, all right, um, so you got two mouths now, you're good to go, uh, I want to see you back in six months. <laughs> And now you're getting a new doctor because your doctor is terrible. <laughs> All right, so there are three vital functions here for the pleural membranes and the and the pleural cavity and the pleural fluid. And those three vital functions. I'm out of time. One more minute. What we've already talked about is that it's a friction reducing system. <laughs> it reduces both friction and fiction because it gets real <laughs> when you have pneumothorax. <laughs> I just I'm so smooth. <laughs> So the fluid, the pleural fluid, lubricates, which helps us to reduce that uh, friction. So when friction increases, that's when it becomes non-fiction, because you get pain with every breath. Okay, so in addition to the friction, This is also going to aid in the development of pressure gradients. That's supposed to be gradients. That was terrible. So as the rib cage, and this is what we're going to talk about when we begin to talk about ventilation here just in a little while, as the ribs move out, they actually pull on the membranes. And those membranes, in turn, pull on the lung tissue. And by increasing volume, we would have a decrease in pressure in the lungs. And that's what's actually going to facilitate air movement in and out of the lungs, is changing pressure gradients. Now, I guess I'll leave you with a cliffhanger this morning. Mentalize, wow. Uh, dang it. <laughs> that might be the longest word I've ever written. Compartmentalization. And we'll talk about that when you come back here on Friday. Okay, who's ready for a exam? Now remember, play by the rules. So don't look at this until you're ready to actually take it. If you have any questions, you can sit down to take it. Please feel free to send me an email. And I'll try to get these emails as soon as I can. If it's...
As I was saying, if you need to ask a question, send me an email. I'll just try to be